Okay, good afternoon everyone. You're very welcome back to this afternoon's session. Um, we're obviously going to be uh, starting a little bit later, so we're going to be adjusting for times as we go along. Um, but I think for a group that aren't used to running major events like this, we're not doing too bad. I've often been at very professional run conferences and they've run off. Mm -hmm. They've run over an awful lot more than, than we are. So to welcome you um, to our first speaker this afternoon, who is Anya Murray. And Anya, for those of you who are not familiar with her work, is an ecologist with a background in environmental science and plant ecology. She has worked on a wide range of conservation initiatives involving hedgerow conservation, forestry, water quality, conservation policy, agriculture, and land use policy and the application of international and national law and policy to conservation issues in Ireland and across Europe. She has been active in the conservation sector and with Irish environmental non-governmental organisations or ENGOs for more than 15 years as a professional conservation ecologist and a political and policy analyst. She has also worked with the EcoEye team researching and presenting the popular environmental television series EcoEye for the past two years, and her talk this afternoon is titled uh, Climate Change and Our Ecosystems, Opportunities and Challenges. Okay. Um, thanks very much for inviting me along today, and time, okay. I'm going to be covering uh, uh, a lot of different issues around the impacts of climate change on biodiversity, in Ireland specifically, also the impacts of some of our responses to climate change on biodiversity, and then going more into how nature and ecosystems are really one of our, our strongest allies in the battle against climate change. Some of the issues have been touched on already by the, the earlier two speakers, but I don't think in a way that um, we have to worry about. So biodiversity, for those who don't know, is really our life support system. We wouldn't have clean air, clean water, fertile soils uh, without biodiversity. And it's definitely vulnerable to climate change, but it also provides nature-based solutions to climate change. Some, an example of ecosystem services are carbon sequestration, a regulation of water in the landscape and climatic regulation, flood prevention and attenuation, protection from natural hazards, and pest regulation. And these are what we call uh, ecosystem services. There's been a lot of work over the last five or 10 years into assessing the economic value of ecosystem services to society. These are effectively services provided to us by nature for free, which we haven't so far valued. It's important to state here that nature uh, has an intrinsic value. So regardless of the value to humans, we might have species which have their own intrinsic value, even if they don't have a particular pest control function or something to us. But I think that the work that's been done to, to, to value ecosystem services is really important because decision makers, as we heard, it's, it's all economists on, on the climate advisory panel and it's the language that they speak. So it's important to kind of make a case for nature in, in terms of its, its value to us. So the first element is climate change is really throwing nature out of sync. And one very simple way to look at this is the bud burst in spring. Uh, and in Ireland, the leafing of some tree species is now occurring 30 days earlier than 30 years ago. Um, that's a, a really massive, massive shift um, from the Botanic Gardens. We know that mountain current uh, is budding 40 days earlier than previously. So, okay, leaves are budding a little bit earlier. Maybe that's not such a big deal. Um, here's one little story, a, a baby blue tit there in the corner. This is not a rare species. It's not a vulnerable species. But the, the first um, flush of oak leaves in spring those oak leaves have very low levels of tannin. And as the oak leaves mature, they get higher le levels of tannin. That's why um, oak was used a lot for tanning leather. And the little caterpillars that feed on those oak leaves, they have low levels of tannin for, with the first uh, flush of leaves. And they are fed to the baby blue tits. And they're palatable. And if the, the leaves uh, come out earlier and there's very high levels of tannin in those leaves, 
the, the caterpillars become unpalatable to the baby blue tits and you have much higher mortality. So it's one tiny little way that you can see that bud burst coming 10, 20, 30 days earlier has a knock-on impact right up the food chain. It's because nature, a lot of natural ecosystems, very, very finely tuned balances between species. We have warming oceans. Uh, one, again, another, just one example is sand eels are shifting north and they're heading beyond the commuting reach of nesting seabirds. So things like kittiwakes and razorbills and arctic terns, they nest on land and they commute out and they also feed their young, they feed themselves on the sand eels. And the sand eels are now kind of beyond reach of what they can travel to and from. Um, this is another really interesting one that I only heard about quite recently, Greenland white-fronted geese. We have half the world's population uh, spend the winter in Ireland, and we've had very sharp declines in recent years. Now, we know that their habitat has been uh, degraded and lost over the past 50, 60 years. That's uh, midland-raised bogs, largely, and a lot of wetland habitats which have been drained away or infilled or harvested. So they're suffering already from this, this habitat loss over decades. And now we have the situation where they summer in Greenland and there's a, a particular type of a bulb that... Uh, it's a bulb and then it turns into a wee plant. And as you move up the mountains in Greenland, it, it progresses each week. Another layer, another altitude layer uh, springs forward for them to eat. And now we're getting this really sudden onset of spring in Greenland, which means that the, the bulbs are all coming out in one glut. So the food source is only available for a week or two, and then it's gone because the bulbs are no longer bulbs, they've turned into plants. Um, so on top of years of habitat loss, decades of habitat loss, these Greenland white-fronted geese are now suffering a, a decline in their food source in spring in Greenland. Again, these are just small examples of how finely tuned natural ecosystems really suffer from changes in temperature. And as well as the species suffering, we have habitats which are being lost. So John mentioned earlier that the peat bogs, uh, there's, there's really awful forecasts for Irish peat bogs just due to drying out from, from climate change. Um, coastal squeeze is another example where sea level rise and increasing wave heights and increased occurrence of coastal storms means that we're going to lose an awful lot of coastal mudflats, which are very, very rich habitats on the right, and salt marsh habitats as well there on the left, because they're all in that, that on the coastal zone and they'll be flooded out. What we need to do, uh, an appropriate policy response to that challenge, is to draw buffer zones around protected areas. So where we currently des have designated a lot of these areas, now there's a lot of problems with that designations already because they're, they're not working particularly well. We're very bad at enforcing the, the, the regulations around protecting these habitat types. So on top of uh, properly protecting protected areas, we need to actually widen the area. So we need to, instead of that red line just going around that mudflat, we need to widen it and allow for that to move inland and not build on areas where we need to allow those habitats to, to move a bit. And we also have an awful lot of new arrivals. John touched on this earlier. We have new insects arriving in Ireland. Could we get mosquitoes instead of midges? Um, we're going to get new pathogens and pests in Ireland. And this is something we really have to cater for in farming and in forestry. And the ch changing climate also means increased opportunities for invasive species. And again, John mentioned the gunnera earlier on. Ocean acidification has been mentioned. Atmospheric carbon dioxide is 30% higher than pre-industrial levels, and the oceans are absorbing a third of the excess carbon dioxide. So you put all of this carbon dioxide gas, mix it in with seawater, and you get a 30% increase in acidity than in pre-industrial times. That's absolutely a massive increase. Uh, ocean acidity has increased significantly in offshore waters around Ireland between 1991 and 2010. And the decreasing um, pH means increasing acidity means that a lot of organisms 
cannot cope, especially the, the plankton, which uh, depend on, on calcium carbonate and uh, all sorts of things that have shells. Uh, here's a cartoon I picked up. We're going to need a really big antacid tablet as the coral reefs are dying off because of the, the um, acidification. And in Ireland, we have this amazing habitat type called cold water coral reefs. We've only discovered them in the early 90s. Um, and these are really important feeding grounds and um, breeding grounds and spawning areas for a lot of fish and shellfish. Common things like mackerel, cod, flatfish and crabs. They're already vulnerable uh, and have been hugely damaged by trawling and um, by exploration for oil and gas. Uh, and now acidification is, is another major threat. And again, these are an ecosystem which are valuable to us in how they, they help sustain fisheries. These are some plankton, um, and a lot of plankton need uh, calcium in order to, to survive and reproduce. They depend on them. Um, and what can we do about this? So this is, this is a fairly dire situation. Um, obviously, first and foremost, reduce greenhouse gas emissions drastically and immediately. Um, also, give protected areas better protection. So Ireland has amongst the worst performance in the EU in terms of implementing our, our nature laws. These are the birds and the habitats directives. Uh, we have a, a huge amount of, of cases against us, legal cases from Europe for not implementing nature laws adequately. So we need to implement them properly and then we need to also do things which I mentioned like, like buffer zones. So we need to go further than what we already have. Um, and then it's also important that we, we don't just protect nature within these designated areas. So we need to look at the wider countryside as well. We need to look at the health of our ecosystems throughout the landscape and not just in the cordoned off protected areas. Um, and healthy ecosystems tend to be a lot more resilient to change. So whatever changes are brought, whether that's pests or disease or climatic changes, uh, ecosystems are more resilient, obviously, when they're healthy. Same as us, same as humans. Um, there's a dearth of understanding among most of us uh, as to what's actually at stake. Um, and this is scientific understanding as well as the understanding of the general public. So populations, how they respond, uh, what the responses are, and what the value to society. A lot of people kind of still think that biodiversity is it's all very well. I get teased all the time for, for being into you know, fluffy squirrels and stuff. Um, they don't really get that biodiversity underpins uh, most of what we, we depend on economically and socially. And we need to be better at communicating positive responses to a lot of these challenges. And then the kind of second segment, the impacts of our responses to climate change. So here we have a, a wind farm. And you can see that it's not just the immediate footprint of the turbines which can be problematic, it's the access routes. Now, we are improving, we as in, in Ireland, in how we, we locate and plan and build wind farms. But there have been huge problems over the last decade or two in how they're built. So they tend to be built in upland peaty soils which are very unstable. When you uh, cut into a bog, because a bog is, is sustained by a raised water table, and you drain away to put a road, it drains a good proportion of that bog on either side of the access route. Um, as I'm going to go into later, uh, peat bogs are very important stores of carbon and methane. So when you start to dry them out, they release a lot. So this is a... It, it goes against the logic of just having a wind farm in order to provide renewable energy when you're causing damage to a habitat which is storing carbon. Uh, there is a way around it. It's sensitive development of wind energy, locating those wind farms in places where they're not going to damage species and habitats. Um, we've, of, we've had, in the west of Ireland, I know in particular, there's been a lot of massive, massive uh, landslides resulting from uh, poorly sited and poorly constructed wind farms. Um, there's a, a, a positive response to this. Uh, BirdLife Europe um, put out a report meeting Europe's renewable energy targets in harmony with nature. And BirdWatch Ireland have recently completed a project called um, 
bird sensitivity mapping for wind energy developments. And this is just, just one segment, but it's saying certain areas are highly sensitive to wind energy development and they should be avoided. Other areas are less sensitive to wind energy development. So if you start to look at planning for all sorts of energy developments in a way that's sensitive to other needs. I remember back in the, the I don't know, maybe 2004 or something, the first draft um, national wind energy plan said that our need to develop renewable energy overrides uh, biodiversity conservation interests. Now, luckily that was removed before the actual final plan was published, but it, that kind of thinking is, is still there that the, 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 the need to address uh, climate change to develop wind energy overrides other needs, uh, overrides conservation challenges, and it's, it's not the case, and we can still develop uh, renewable energies in a way that is more in harmony with biodiversity objectives. Um, also forestry, th there's a huge uh, increased target in the last year for afforestation in Ireland. Uh, unfortunately, we're still very attached to Sitka spruce monocultures in Ireland. Um, we tend to have a lot of just Sitka spruce a lot of it tends to be in upland peaty soils. In order to plant up an upland peat bog, you have to drain that off first. And again, there's a, there's a huge amount of um, methane and carbon dioxide released from those peat bogs when you drain them off in order to plant the forestry. There's huge problems with, with a lot of forestry here with our current forestry policy. Uh, and forestry is getting more and more clout and support because it's seen as a, as a good response to climate change because trees, as they grow, soak up um, carbon dioxide. Uh, and again, it's just not black and white. We do need to have more tree cover in Ireland. We need more forestry, but we need to do it in such a way that it's not uh, damaging very sensitive species and habitats. Um, And we have a huge suite of what's, again, it's quite, quite a new area. It's come out in the last five or 10 years, nature-based solutions to climate change. So ecosystems need to be placed at the core of our responses to climate change in both mitigation and adaptation strategies. Uh, Achim Steiner, he's not the, the Under Secretary General anymore, but he said restoration of peatlands is low hanging fruit and among the most cost effective options for mitigating climate change. Uh, peat bogs are massively important stores of carbon dioxide, carbon and methane. Um, in Ireland they store 1.2 billion tonnes of carbon and they actively sequester, so that means as the peat grows it actively sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and locks that away as, as peat or turf. The 60,000 uh, tonnes is for blanket bogs, which are the, the bogs that cover the, the high mountains, the kind of thinner layers of peat, and then the 140,000 um, tonnes is for the, the, the deep peat. Um, so this is a really good thing, that peat bogs store so much carbon. But as I said, the they're, they're sustained by a high water table. Once you lower down that water table, you drain the bog. All of the, the plant matter that makes up that peat starts to decompose. The reason why they store the carbon is because it doesn't decompose. That's what peat is. And once you drain it, it starts to decompose, and it releases a huge amount of, of carbon dioxide and methane. So they become hot spots of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Borden and Mona harvest 4 million tonnes of milled peat per year for energy. And there's the, the new peat-fired power plant uses a million tonnes of peat annually. Uh, and this is subsidised. We're subsidising this um, under our public service obligation levy. 2011-2012 was about 40 million. Uh, and this has, has gone on year on year. We're subsidising the use of, of peat for electricity generation in Ireland. Um, the IPCC fifth assessment, assessment report it talked about a third of all anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions being caused by land use changes. So that's very broad, that's deforestation and that's uh, peat use and it's a whole range of different things. But peat is a big, big one of those. Emissions from peatland drainage and burning alone are estimated at around nine gigatons of carbon dioxide per annum. So uh, this is peat bogs in Ireland, but it's also peat bogs in Indonesia and a lot of other places around the world. I think Belarus have this major program of uh, restoring their peatlands, and they're, they're doing that in order that they may, in the future, get some financial return for that under climate agreements. Um, 
So there is, in the last year or two, we're, we're gaining some traction with this. So five years ago, talking about this, it was news to everybody. Now we are hearing a bit more about it, but we really need to, for a start, cap the carbon and methane loss from our peat bogs. Uh, keeping them wet is a lot of it, um, and also restoring peat bogs that have been harvested and degraded. That's it, particularly important for, for the Midlands and for the west of Ireland. The main thing that we really hear about in terms of peat here is the, the turf cutters and the rights of the turf cutters to keep harvesting peat in protected bogs. That's definitely an issue that is relevant here, but it's a much, much bigger issue. So there's um, unlicensed extraction of, of peat uh, at an industrial scale by private operators for horticultural peat moss as well as for energy. And that's something we really need to look at in Ireland. Um, there was a High Court ruling, a case taken by Antashka, the, the ruling was in 2015, um, where the High Court upheld a case um, to quash permission granted by Board Panola to Board Panola, um, Board Nimona, and the reason was that the environmental impact assessment that had been carried out didn't look at the, the wider implications, the off-site implications of harvesting that quantity of peat to keep that um, power station going. Um, they called it a functional inter interdependence between the power plant and the Board Nimona bogs. Um, and Board Panola had completely excluded consideration of the indirect effects on the environment of burning up to 1.2 million tonnes of peat per annum and its deliberations on whether the life of the power plant should be extended. Now, this was climate, but it was also water. Water quality is a big issue in terms of the sediment that comes from uh, peat harvesting operations. Um, and then there was a big furore over jobs and that the, the power plant, uh, the Irish public will pay approximately 120 million in the next 12 months in order to keep three woefully unprofitable and pollution intensive peat burning plants open that employ around 500 people. Um, oh, I've forgotten the figure at the end, that's got knocked off. Um, Antashka put out a press release talking about retrofitting and creates 26 jobs per million spent, that's direct, indirect, and um, induced a redirected peat um, PSO subsidy could create and support around 3,120 jobs. Sorry, there's the 240,000 which should go at the end of the first paragraph. So just when we talk about jobs and money, if we rethink, and this is true for a lot of other cases, we really need to rethink if there's a subsidy going in, could that be put to better use in terms of jobs and employment and a wider common, uh, common gain, I suppose? If it's public money, it should be going towards uh, activities which have a wider public benefit. Um, peat bogs are also really, really important in terms of water tables, so they hold back flood waters. It, this tends to not be the case for very, very big flood events or for upland peat bogs, but for lowland peat bogs and other types of wetland within the floodplain, they literally hold back the water, so they slow the movement of water downstream, and they can really alleviate flooding uh, in, in towns. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in the UK on this. Um, also, they, because they slow down the, the, the movement of water from mountain top to valley bottom, uh, it helps infiltration of, of rainfall to groundwater. In terms of water quality, um, peat bogs filter water as well. Restoration and conservation management of peatlands is a pressing priority for mitigating against climate change. So we need to stop harvesting peat, and that's turf cutting on all the designated bogs. At the moment, we've been focusing on the, the raised bogs, the Midland SAC bogs, and we haven't been giving any attention, whether it's government or, or press and media, to the blanket bogs, the upland blanket bogs, where, where turf cutting continues. Um, also, horticultural peat moss has gotten very little, little focus of attention and energy. Uh, and on top of stopping harvesting, we also need to, to restore a lot of the peat bogs. Um, and that means raising the water table. I've been to a conference in Wales where they looked at all the different approaches to restoring peat bogs. And some of them were very, very technological. And some of them were, were very basic. They were getting school children to make felted rugs to, to literally put like plasters across the, the blanket peat and stop the erosion, stop the rainfall from eroding more, more peat gullies. So there's a whole field of, of work out there on how to restore peat bogs, and there's a lot of work in Canada and in the UK and in Ireland. We're, we're just starting on this, and um, we have a lot, a lot to do.
um, said that this is too expensive to switch because peat is often pitched as a, a very valuable indigenous uh, fuel source. Um, subsidising electricity generation from peat, 120 million per year. And what Ireland committed to the Green Climate Fund at, at Paris was 2 million. So we really need to, to balance what's, what's too expensive. Um, wetlands, I've mentioned many wetlands buffer against flooding and these provide a natural flood protection. Conservation and creation of wetlands is essential for, for adaptation because as we know we're going to get an awful lot more um, flood events with climate change. And then the oceans, I know that acidification has been touched on by both speakers. But the oceans are a massive, massive heat store. They're also a carbon pump and a carbon sink. Um, acidification is a big problem, and we don't tend to think that one in every two breaths comes from plankton. I know earlier, I think it was John said, one, one third of our oxygen that we breathe comes from the Amazon. Um, one half comes from, from plankton. Um, I haven't, uh, can I go back? Um, the, the, the whole marine ecosystem and climate thing, I was, I was researching last year for EcoEye and I've kind of stayed away from marine issues over the last 10 years and it was actually a real re revelation to me the extent to which um, ocean life, marine life, soaks up, acts again like a, a pump drawing uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and the whole story about the, the whales. So whales uh, feed on plankton, some types of whales, the filter feeders, and they tend to feed on that uh, quite deep, and then they come up near the surface where they poo, so you've got these huge fecal plumes which effectively fertilize the deep ocean. So this is way beyond the reach of around the continental shelf, so we talk about normally fertilizers are, are a problem because eutrophication or too many fertilizers in our water is, is not a good thing. But in the deep oceans, they found this, this link, it's called a trophic cascade, where the whales fertilize the deep ocean and that makes more plankton grow and as a result of that you get more mackerel and more krill so you get more abundant fisheries and then a lot of these plankton and these these small things that the phytoplankton the zooplankton the whole food chain up you've got more life and that tends to sink to the deep ocean and then a good portion of that um carbon effectively drops away to the ocean floor and is locked away for tens of thousands of years. So very, very long-term locking away of carbon dioxide. So they found that a, a healthy population of whales not only um, encourages a healthy uh, population of fish in terms of fisheries, but also acts as, uh, you know, in our favor in terms of climate change. Um, agriculture, I know that uh, John touched on this a wee bit. Primary agriculture in Ireland is about 2.5% of GDP. That's just primary ag agriculture, 10% of Irish exports. But the failure to reach our 2020 targets is going to be caused almost entirely, I think John said entirely, by this sector. And we have major expansion plans for the dairy industry under um, Harvest 2020. And this is something that we really, really need to look at in Ireland. Is this just, I mean, it, uh, there's also water quality problems and a lot of a uh, lot of biodiversity related issues with the expansion of agriculture which is is seriously problematic and isn't discussed in Ireland it's not it's not out there in the media enough uh, we need to have a national conversation and decide is is this really what what we want um and Enda Kenny and that's all three of us so far have talked about uh, Enda Kenny in Paris um, Ireland is seeking concession on emissions reductions to accommodate the growth in agricultural outputs. Uh, so we're, we're pleading that we're a special case. Ireland is special, our agriculture is particularly important to us, we're doing this great job of feeding the world, um, therefore we need a special concession to allow growth of, of agriculture in Ireland and that will mean that we will overshoot our targets but we want a special dispensation. Um, so we really need to finalize our first national mitigation plan. Um, and that's another, just a little stat. We emit more greenhouse gases than the 400 million of the world's poorest people. And yet we're up there pleading for a special case, which I, I think is just morally wrong. Um, so a summary of solutions, uh, integration of biodiversity protection into all sectors, including climate change mitigation and adaptations. This is in agriculture in land use planning, so where we, we build our roads and our houses, and we've, we've done, during the boom, we did a lot of uh, 
putting housing estates in floodplains, which we're now talking about compensation for those or moving those, we really need to start factoring in the much more frequent and severe flood events in the future. Uh, we need to factor that in to land use planning. Energy as well, whether it's wind farms or energy that comes from peat uh, and forestry. So forestry, again, in, in a number of different ways. So the resilience of forestry, when you have a monoculture, I think everybody knows the basic, it's more vulnerable to pests or diseases or storms or fires. We've had a huge amount of fires, forest fires each April because we tend to have these very dry April. I know it's not true this year. Um, and then there's a huge amount of forest fires. When you have a more mixed forest, uh, it tends to be less uh, vulnerable to massive forest fires. The same is true for, for pests and diseases. So we really need to move away from the, the forestry monocultures that we're so attached to in Ireland. Um, that's relevant already. I mean, forget climate change. That, that's, that's important for biodiversity objectives. But it's now, there's this whole other suite of reasons that come with climate change to really diversify our approach to forestry in Ireland. And it's especially important because we do need, we, we have one of the lowest forest covers in Europe. We need more forestry in Ireland, but we need to do it properly. We also need to strengthen the protection mechanisms for nature in protected areas. So SACs, that's special areas of conservation, special protection areas for birds and uh, national heritage areas. Often the, the only communication in the media about protected areas and designations is negative. Uh, the analogy of Cromwellian takeover of our land and government coming in and telling us what we, we can and can't do with our land. Uh, and that's because when, when these, the legislation came into force um, in the 90s and in the noughties, it was done really badly and there was, very, there was very poor communication about what designation means. There was very uh, poor support for landowners and farmers. There was often a conflict which just wasn't addressed. Uh, this is something that we need to address now because we know that nature conservation is important in its own right, but it's also more and more important to, to make the, the landscape and ourselves more resilient to the impacts of climate change and in the wider countryside as well, so not just within the designated areas. I think I've made, I've made that point quite clear already, cessation of peat harvesting, capping of carbon loss from all bogs and peatland restoration, and climate-proof forestry policy. Continuous cover forestry, the CCF, is one general suite of approaches to, to having forestry that's it's not clear fell. I think that's it. Um, really doesn't come out at all. We're the first generation to feel the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can do anything about it. Uh, this is an image that I was involved in. It's a woman, that's her pregnant uh, tummy, and it's a, it's a planet Earth, it's a globe. So it's supposed to evoke the, the feelings that we all have of when you see a pregnant woman coming onto the bus, you know, you'll, you'll make your, your seat available to her. We don't tend to have that kind of nurturing uh, emotive response to the planet. It might sound a bit hippy-dippy, but I think it's important for us to kind of get back to understanding the, the, the dynamics of nature and understanding the, the extent of the impacts that we're having. If we're to protect ourselves, we must do more to enhance ecosystem resilience and um, protect nature so it can help to protect us. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. I think I'm probably ahead of time. Thank you very much, Anya, and she has left uh, time for questions, and there is a roving mic on the way, so if you just put your hand up if you have a question, and then John will make his way to you, over on the left-hand side, all the way over, oh sorry, Helen, and then the gentleman on the left. What hope do we have when <coughs> government gives grants to rebuild stone walls and on, by so doing, rip out all the trees and brambles that are in the way. What hope is there? If they give grants for that, how will you encourage the farmer to actually keep the biodiversity? Yeah, we, we have a, a great history in Ireland and probably everywhere else too of perverse subsidies. Um, and that would be on, on a local scale that's really important. The same, same is true for peat, the same is true for, I mean, in the, in the, in the 80s farmers were, were given money to rip out all of their hedgerows. 
um, to consolidate fields and farms, and then 20 years later they're being given money to plant in the hedgerows, um, and that the loss of, of ancient hedgerows in the process has been massive. And yet, what can we do? Speak up about it, um, make the case, we, we need, we need the scientific research, but in, in many cases, I think that the, the data is actually there. We, we know what the situation is, we know what the story is, or the, or the consequences of perverse subsidies. But people need to speak up about it more and more. Uh, NGOs tend to be uh, fighting the case for a change in those perverse subsidies. Uh, there, there was a big involvement from a lot of Irish and European NGOs in common agricultural policy, which was reformed in 2013. And that was trying to make sure that all those payments, 40% we, we, of the EU budget goes on, on payments to farmers, goes on cap. 40% of the EU budget. And a lot of those payments were going towards things which were environmentally damaging and climate damaging. Um, there was a massive campaign. We were largely unsuccessful, but it was the first really big campaign against really big vested interests. So again, supporting NGOs, joining local environment groups and speaking up about these issues, I think. And there is, there's, a, there's still a lot of apathy out there, but your question is what hope have we? Speak up, get involved. Oh, sorry, okay, yeah, take your question. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, I really agree with you when you say that it's important to strengthen mechanisms of protection of nature, both in the, in the, in the areas of natural areas of special conservation, but also in the wider countryside. Do you, what would be your suggestions for how we could do that, how we could strengthen these mechanisms of protection? There's, there's, there's um, God, where do I start? One of them is, I've already mentioned CAP, so the Common Agricultural Policy, um, and that's the, the subsidy for farmers to, to farm or to produce. And there's a lot of ways in CAP can, can really be a driver for positive change. So things like ecological focus areas on farms uh, and protection of, of habitats, small on-farm habitats. Um, and that was an opportunity that was largely missed in the recent reform of the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, the same could be said for, for planning and development outside of protected areas. So again, just one, one small example that springs to mind is that the wind farm there with all the, um, the access routes cutting into the bog. That can be a case outside of SACs and SPAs as well as inside of, of protected areas. Um, there's also a lot to be said for, for local biodiversity plans. So county development plans can identify local, locally important areas for biodiversity and communities to get involved with, I suppose, claiming um, their own biodiversity areas and getting involved in, in protection and conservation of those areas. I met a group down in Abbey Leaks last year who had gone into a non-SAC bog uh, and effectively stopped the bulldozers from coming in and harvesting that bog. And they did that entirely on their own bat uh, and ended up uh, preventing that bog from being harvested. And they now manage that bog as a community with a few grants um, for, for conservation. So I think communities, I suppose, taking charge of, of locally important biodiversity areas is, is another way. But Policies, we really need to infiltrate every policy out there, whether it's energy or forestry. The forestry have gone on about a bit, but that, that can be very damaging or it can be very positive, depending on which way it's done. And a lot of forestry, most forestry is outside of SACs and SPAs. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's about kind of greening a lot of the, the other policy areas. And it's quite convenient, I think, for people to think of, well, we have our designated areas, so we've taken care of biodiversity. Uh, when really that's not the case. We need to look at, at every transport policy, every, every different area of policy and kind of, yeah, tweak them to biodiversity. Th there was a fellow down there with his hand up for a while. Um, I, I visited uh, Glendalough there uh, a few weeks back and I was talking to the forest ranger there and um, there's a lot of tree die off there and he was telling me that there's the main cause of tree die off is there's actually lack of sunlight getting to the trees. So there's actually mold growing on the trees. And the ash tree in Ireland is one of the biggest uh, threats now to all tree die off. So I was just wondering if you're aware of the, the fungus that are now growing on trees from reduced uh, sunlight and what would be your response to that? I'm not aware of, of a lack of sunlight, no, but I'm, I'm aware of ash dieback, all right. Um, and that is a, a quite a serious threat to ash specifically. And a lot of the, the, 
the non-Sitka spruce planting that we've done in, in our recent afforestation is comprised of ash. So it's a really, really big threat. And again, it points to having a mixed forest. So even if it's a native broadleaf species like ash, if you put it in a monoculture, it's a lot more vulnerable to, to the spread of um, the pathogens that cause ash dieback. Yeah. It's also important to say that our response shouldn't be too drastic either. So there's, because it's, it's affecting an economic interest, it doesn't mean that we should then go out and remove all of our ash from all of our hedges. That, that's, a, a, that's an over-response, I would suggest. Yeah. Only one of the most heartening programs in EcoEye was when, I think it was the Blackwater, I think it was, was you that uh, were getting the farmers involved in conserving the fish. And this, this is really what we need in Ireland. We have this war between green people, ecologists, and farmers. And this was just so uh, inspiring. I just wonder, is it going to happen in other places? And, and he, this was the beginning, or maybe there's more happening, but it, it, that is where we need to go. We need to have farmers and um, ecologists working together. Yeah, thanks a million for that, because that, that is, I think that's the, my biggest revelation over the last year or two is realizing just, I mean, just how badly we've done by, suddenly we have to introduce a whole load of these European laws, it's very top down, we were very dictatorial about how we were implementing them, and there was very little involvement of local communities, it was far too top down. Um, and there's been a lot of really excellent conservation initiatives which have come from the ground up. We now need to facilitate, when I say we, I mean we as a, as a nation and national policy need to facilitate ground up conservation approaches as well as top down. And I was really amazed by that, um, that community. I mean, there's, there's farmers out there who literally saw the river as a hindrance, as something they had to get the cattle across, as something they weren't allowed to spray too near. It's something that's just you know, it, it's an unfortunate thing that you've got the river bordering onto your farm because it means restrictions versus, oh, this is really interesting. I've never gone out angling and the local angling club were, were working with the farmers and training them up in angling. And, it, you know, it, it changes the perspective. So I think we need to kind of break down those, those divisions that we've had over the last 30 years where it's uh, conservationists versus the farmers versus the government um, and start to, when, when you bring things down to a community level, um, face to face, people are, are much more inclined to, to work together for positive solutions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anya. Thank you.